Um, well, I'll call this meeting to order. Um, we do have some folks who showed up to provide public comment. Um, Phyllis and Warren, welcome. Um, I'm Bonnie Fiosic. I'm the chair of the Parks Board. I use she, her pronouns. Um, you have two minutes. We, I don't believe you submitted anything in writing in advance, but regardless, you've got two minutes to make your public comment. Um, so welcome. Floor is yours. Well, thank you. And, and thank you for the opportunity to speak with you. Uh, Phyllis and I are here to ask that there be serious consideration given to renaming Kelly Point Park. Anyone reading the park signage or the Bureau website would learn that the park was named after a deranged man from New England who visited Oregon briefly and upon returning to the East tried to gain fame and fortune by unsuccessfully encouraging establishment of a city at the confluence of the Willamette and Columbia Rivers. We understand the complexity of the park naming process, but this is one of the more egregious examples of an inappropriate name and something that should not take years to rectify. Parks policy states that park names should reflect the significance of a feature and the community it serves, providing an enduring legacy. The name should be appropriate to the location and remain relevant as the community grows and changes. Naming categories include historic events, people and places, and outstanding individuals. While Kelly may be a mildly interesting historical figure, the park that bears his name is very unique and has an important untold history. This place was documented in the journals of Lewis and Clark as the home of the Cascades Band of the Chinook people. We suffer greatly from our lack of knowledge about our own native history. Renaming this park gives us an opportunity to both honor the people who actually live there and educate, educate Portlanders and visitors to our city. It deserves an appropriate name with acknowledgement of the people who were there way before and much longer than Kelly. In the meantime, we hope that the park signage and website can be rewritten to include the importance of this place to native peoples. Thank you. Excuse me. Thank you so much, Phil and, Phyllis and Warren. Um, we really appreciate you coming and addressing us today. Um, I do know that the, uh, the senior staff is here and can take that suggestion. Um, and I believe that Michelle has your contact information so we can get back to you and follow up with that. Thank you very much for that information. I really appreciate it. And thank you and thank you for all your good work. Appreciate it. Thank you, Warren. Um, with that, was there any other public comment requests? No. Okay, very good. And I see we have Commissioner Ryan here. Hi. Welcome, Commissioner Ryan. Thanks. And Kelly Torres. Yes. Um, oh, and Karen. Karen. <laughs> or Tadden, for yes. those that, that use Spanish. Uh, I don't know. Did you want to introduce? Sure. Are, are, you, are you ready for this? I, I think we are. I, we'll, we'll go ahead and start with those that you're here. Well, I don't know. You look like you're getting. I don't think he needs any uh, any introduction. But um, uh, as you all know, um, Parks Bureau was was reassigned at the new year. Um, we are now uh, working under Commissioner Dan Ryan's um, oversight, and uh, we've been meeting fairly regularly, pretty uh, over the last week. And we're just really excited to, to have him uh, join us tonight. Um, you, you all might remember Kelly Torres. She worked for Parks for many years, as did Karen. So we're lucky enough to have two ex-Parkies who are going to be supporting um, our work with the, um, the commissioner's office. So I'll just hand it off to you if you want to say a few words. Thank you, Director Wong. Yeah, I think it's almost uh, karma uh, because Kelly, then we also had charity that you. So I remember. Um, we, we got off to a good start and then then there was probably this moment where you're like, could you stop rating my yeah, staff Parks and Rec? <laughs> so <laughs> so it probably it's all full circle there. Yeah. <laughs> so my name is Dan Ryan. I'm on city council. I've been on city council for two years and three months. I came on during the, uh, the summer of 2020. Uh, September oh, 10th. We're gonna have a video. Where do so I go? Like, like I'm so confused. Would you like to be yeah. here so that you're addressing? Am I, is yeah. my back? Is your back is your oh, back. I'm so sorry. No. Would you like? Uh, would you like uh, <laughs> <laughs> would right, I'm gonna adjust place? myself. I'll, uh, switch, okay. I'll switch places with you for the time. I'll just stand. Yeah. <laughs> I'll right here. This is my favorite scene. I'm yeah. on video. Okay. Hi. These hybrid meetings are so clunky don't you think hi <laughs> everyone's that one waves we know you're like paying attention <laughs> oh then you see my belly this is good <laughs> all right 
hi, <laughs> I'm going to a Blazer game uh, with my nephews. It's an annual tradition. So hopefully we picked a game we could actually win. Um, <laughs> so I just wanted to say that uh, coming on to city council in September 2020 was um, fascinating. And like a lot of people, if it wasn't for the parks, I don't know what I would have done, especially the week I started, because it was the, well, that was the week you're supposed to stay inside because of the smoke. But I was just reminded throughout that period where if it wasn't for walking to the two local parks near me, I don't know what I would have done, because it's the one place where I could kind of catch humanity, you know, where I felt like I was kind of safe. I feel really awful that I'm like, you have a mask on, so do you and I don't. Um, <laughs> you're fine, you're fine. But, Why uh, you wear mask? <laughs> so anyway, it's, 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 it feels, um, I just want to start with that, that just uh, how important it was to remember that experience when he was coming on. The mayor gave me really light assignments, like here, jump into the deep end. So I got um, the dotted line to the county's uh, office of homelessness. And that's a fascinating gig, because you're like, um, it's like you had a really bad divorce attorney, and um, I'm just gonna be honest. And so the the <laughs> you have no rights really, but when the kid's in trouble, everyone like calls up the city because the county controls everything. But if the kid goes to the principal's office, man, you get the phone call. So that was a really fun experience, and um, I enjoyed being honest about what's going on because the truth is our marketplace, our region doesn't have a system from people who are chronically homeless who are in our public right away, sadly, um, untreated with mental health and behavioral health issues. And as a city, as a state, we should be absolutely embarrassed about that. And I have a motto, it's about better to have direction than perfection. So I like action and it's important to do things. And so I'm really proud of my time in that role um, because we got some systems, we, we called out that that system didn't exist. And, uh, and we also debunked a lot of false narratives. And I think with uh, BDS, the same thing, we've had a permitting challenge in our city for decades. And uh, we, we're making headway now, because uh, like any good work, you go together and you go far, it takes a little bit longer, but we have all eight bureaus, which is how I got to know some of the good people from the Parks Department. And I thought I'd just start off with like what this journey has been like. Then it was about two months ago and the mayor made it really clear that we were going to have these areas, these work areas, which is just really smart. And when I remember when I got elected, I said, Mayor, just give me assignments that are connected to one another. So Housing Bureau, Joint Office, and BDS, they're kind of connected. So I love that this one is about arts, culture, and livability. Who doesn't want to get behind that? And so I really was excited to say yes. But before I go on any further, this won't take that long, but I'm going to put you on a timer, so it won't. I want you to um, obviously just say your name again. I mean, I can see all of you up there and I see them here, but tell me, like if you had 30 seconds to tell me something you want me to know, what is it? And we'll start with the people in the room. Do you wanna go first? Yeah, I'm happy, I'm happy to go first. Um, Karen, nice to meet you. Hi. Um, I think the biggest thing I would say for me is, you probably already know this, but we have a huge deferred maintenance backlog there's need for more funding, but we still, we have an operating levy. I'm not sure that all the citizens understand the difference between yeah. an operating levy and covering deferred maintenance. And so how to communicate that, how to secure more funding. Sorry, what? You can, oh, for deferred maintenance. I think that's probably that. The other is what are we, I, am a, I have two young children. And so I'm very familiar, as I think probably every parent of young children, about the need for Kelly, aquatics. Did you put the 30 seconds on. Oh, sorry. <laughs> sorry. <laughs> Thank you. Of the need for aquatics. We, PPR provides swim lessons to our youth. We don't have another outlet. They don't do it through the schools. I think we need to think big, have vision about how do we partner with PPS and make sure that kids can get. I feel like I'm back on the school board. Like, yes, and think, yeah, okay. that's a good thing. Thanks, Commissioner. I'm Bonnie Geosic. I'm chair of the Parks Board. We've met before. Um, so my day job, I'm uh, I do economic analysis for Echo Northwest and. Um, you stole my, you know, I was going to take, I, I was going to take um, access to aquatics. It's so important. We know for a fact that 
Um, drowning is the number one cause of death for children under 17, and it's perfectly preventable. There's no reason that every child in Portland who wants access to swim lessons shouldn't have them. Thank you. Remedies of leadership skill. That's great. Hello, my name is Melody. I'm the chief policy analyst, and I'm also on the ENI team. And I've been working to um, build a policy framework and a new policy system so we can have everything organized and in a central location, which I'll be presenting on tonight. Um, I think um, since I've been here, I've been here for a few months. I started last April. Um, I'm just really inspired by all the people in the Bureau who uh, we have a lot of new hires. We have a lot of great energy um, in the direction that we're going with Healthy Parks, Healthy Portland. And I think that um, prioritizing um, equity and accessibility in all our new um, facilities and programs and services is something that we should do and not just concentrate accessibility, for example, in one program and make sure that it's um, it is broad in, in, in all our new efforts. And, um, and then so it, whatever you can do to support that, that direction, that momentum that we have in the Bureau right now would be great. I'm gonna see my time. Yeah. I'll go ahead and see my time as well. Oh, that was like a quick jump. <laughs> Uh, hi, I'm Allie Berman. My day job is Communications and Marketing Director at Portland Audubon. I'm also a disability advocate. And I would say that Portland Parks cares for 15% of the land in Portland. When we think of climate resilience and what it means to, sorry, uh, and what it means to manage land and habitat and equitable access to nature, all of that, this is a huge piece of that puzzle for the city. And I hope they consider it as such. Also, just thinking of the backlog, the ADA, uh, is a major part of what needs to be a part of that backlog. So in terms of making an accessible space for all people. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, Adrian. And um, yeah, I just wanted to highlight the issue about maintenance because I think it's a bigger word than that in the sense that um, as you described, Portland parks are so important to you and they really are a shining star for many Portlanders. Um, they are in many respects world-class, um, but they are gonna fail one by one if we don't address not only continuing to you know, aim for world-class such as Forest Park, et cetera, but if we don't actually fix them, um, you may have heard already in city council about Columbia Pool, which has essentially been condemned. And uh, we're on track to have that happen, facility after facility. So we really need to change, turn this around. Thanks. I live in North Portland. I went to Roosevelt High School. I hear so much about that. Yeah. No, Maximo, you can introduce okay. uh -huh. I'm Maximo Barron. So I'm the Recreation Services Manager for the Bureau. And um, I just at a, a high level. Um, you know, I uh, personally have uh, navigated a lot of institutions that were designed to uh, leave me out and leave me behind. Um, but uh, recreation has always provided opportunity. And now I'm in a spot where um, I can contribute, uh, uh, lead and participate uh, and engage and engage with others who um, are uh, also excited, bring a lot of ideas and are waiting to meet us for uh, that work. And so. That's uh, what uh, brought me here and keeps me here. Thanks. Hey, Dan, thanks for being here. Uh, I'm Adam, go Blazers, love the shirt. Um, <laughs> but in, in sort of in lieu of offering up specific focus areas, I think I'd rather use my time to talk about like, different frameworks that I'd love you to focus on as you make decisions. And the first one is reimagining play as a human right. And that as you make decisions about who gets to play, where we put parks, how we expand recreation access, is really recognize that that's not only sort of in the fabric of creating healthy youth, but also in the fabric of creating just society. Um, and the second is to constantly really focus on considering the way that parks can collaborate with other bureaus. The parks being a function of public safety and as a function of homeless services. Um, it's like it <laughs> Looking for work anytime. <laughs> um, anyway, are you on the board or on the staff? I'm on the board. That makes sense by your comment. Okay. The white tents are board members and the green tents are staff. Thank you. I'll <laughs> that one out. Hi. 
Hi, uh, my name is Alejandro Arizola. I'm my professional life in the conservation director with the Forest Park Conservancy. So I'm lucky enough to work pretty much on a daily basis with uh, Portland Park and Recreation staff. I guess my comment to you is uh, that Portland Park and Recreation staff are probably most, most knowledgeable and committed staff in the city that I've run into. And I can only hope they find a champion in you, support their uh, decision making and their priorities. Hi, I'm Corbin. I am an assistant professor at Portland State University in Urban Studies and Planning. And I'm co signing what everybody said. There's so many great um, comments. For me, it's really about centering Parks and Rec as the city's ecological service and really understanding that without Parks and Rec, we may not actually have a city in the future and really centering that. The other part I want to put, bring up is really looking at parks as a way of places to congregate, really building in leisure, especially as we're getting a lot more people living in apartments, they don't have backyards, so barbecues, chairs, place for play people to just hang out. I've noticed not a lot of um, benches. I've noticed not a lot of um, barbecue areas, and I'm very surprised that I don't see as many people just hang out in parks. I'm new to Portland. I moved here in November 2020, which it was during COVID, so I expected a lot more engagement in parks. And so for me, it's how do we set up parks to for neighbors, for people to meet their neighbors and to build community in those spaces. So. We'll go to the screen. Yeah, go Big to the yeah. screen. What, where are we, how are I we doing can, on time? I okay. can help you identify the board members. It's yeah, let's, I, if it's okay, if we just do the, the board yep. members on the screen. So um, yeah. I'm gonna go in the order that they show up on that screen, okay. Casey. Thank you, and, and thank you, Commissioner Ryan, for being here. I'm Casey Mills, I'm a retired lawyer. I'm the presently the board's vice chair. And I, I pretty much agree with everything that everybody else has said. I'll just kind of say it in my own way, which is we should invest in and then leverage the parks and its natural areas and its program to make Portland, including its downtown, the place to be again. Thanks, Casey. Uh, David. Hey, Commissioner Ryan. Um, thanks for coming today. I'm, my name is David Stazak. I'm an architect here in Portland. Um, and I'm the chair of the land use and um, infrastructure working group. And so as the chair of that group, I have to kind of jump on the bandwagon with, with a number of other comments that you've heard today, which is let's focus on that um, deferred maintenance backlog. Let's just keep, keep what we can do to, to keep these facilities and spaces from um, falling into this disarray. So thanks for joining us today. Absolutely. Sabrina. Hi, good evening. Um, I'm just off maternity leave, so I'm feeding my baby. So I'll turn my video on in a little bit. But um, I think for me, uh, well, at first, I'm the executive director of the Rosewood Initiative out in East Portland. Um, and I think it's just important to note that, you know, East Portland doesn't have the same history of investment as other parts of the city. Parks has been doing a really great job of um, ensuring that we are investing in East Portland, and I just want to, you know, encourage us to keep that up. We've got hugely diverse population, a lot of young people, the future of our city, and so, um, so yeah. And also another former party, um, <laughs> Ilana. Thank you so much for taking the time to be here with us tonight, Commissioner. My name is Ilana Pertalgini. I work in policy development and government affairs in my day job. I'm glad to be on the Parks Board. I would just say you've heard a lot of different visions tonight of roles that parks can play in the city. And I would encourage you to think about our parks broadly as part of the solution to many of the problems that Portland faces right now that all sorts of cities are facing. And really think about how parks can help be part of the backbone of the infrastructure of our city in a way that reaches people um, and connects people just like the rest of our infrastructure does and really think about how it can be a fundamental piece of what we invest in in our city the same way we look at the rest of our infrastructure. I would also just put a plus one next to the aquatics comments that you've heard. Thanks, Ilana. Paul. Welcome, Chris. Welcome, welcome Commissioner Ryan. Thank you. I want to put my own spin on it. I agree with 
things that people have presented. Clearly parks are critical for livability and to pick up on the theme of important infrastructure, parks provide space for public health, physical health, mental health, and environmental health. And so to my way of thinking, I'm a landscape architect and civil engineer, by the way, parks should be on the same status as Water Bureau, BES, um, and PBOT. It's critical infrastructure, and that really is essential. And unfortunately, we've mentioned the deferred maintenance backlog. It's often referred to as half a billion dollars. In terms of the deferred maintenance backlog, in terms of asset base, parks deferred maintenance backlog is the greatest of all of the city bureaus by an order of magnitude. And to, to um, Adrian, Adrian's point earlier, we're gonna start losing more and more facilities like Columbia Pool if we don't find a new funding mechanism to help us keep that legacy going strongly. Thank you. We have Randy Gregg, who is an ex-officio member, and then we're gonna come back to Chris O'Grady here. Okay. Um, hi, Commissioner. Uh, Randy Gregg, uh, Director of Portland Parks Foundation. Um, very simply, we help people help parks. We're all about <clears throat> community-led initiatives to improve our parks and to program them and uh, about private-public partnerships. So looking forward to working with you. Chris, 30 Hi. seconds on what's important to you. Parks, <laughs> okay. Parks uh, uh, Chris O'Grady, uh, pronouns uh, she, her. Uh, uh, for me, really, it's about um, creating an environment for children and families. Uh, parks are critical infrastructure for the well-being of children and families in community. Um, as a member, a, a tribal member as well, I think it's a real matter of equity and being a steward of the land and having green spaces available to communities that they can participate in, as well as recreational activities too. And I, if I could, just before you start, yeah. I just want to point out, even though we're not going to invite them to speak, that we've got some division managers and um, operations and strategy members are joining us. Lauren McGuire, who you've met recently, Jen Cairo, who you've met, Tanya Booker is our land stewardship manager, Vicente Harrison is our uh, safety, security, and emergency management manager. Then we have Margaret Evan is our workforce development manager. Kenya Williams is our equity manager. And Claudio Capizano, you met also as our finance manager. I think I got everyone. Yeah, great. Oh, I'm in, I'm in one of the boxes up there. Yes, you are. <laughs> Where is that? Is that at the top? Though? It says yeah. your Bonnie Geo Because she has her, she has her well, camera yeah, on and her laptop. Place. That's why. <laughs> I actually really want to say that I will focus on what I heard today. It was um, not surprising that infrastructure came up a lot. Um, my career background was in development and nonprofits, so I am well aware of public-private partnerships. Um, if we didn't get the investments in from the private community, then we, the nonprofit can uh, be innovative because a lot of government grants just don't allow that. So it, it's, it's, it's exciting to always um, focus on that. And also, when I've done capital campaigns, it was always an afterthought about um, what will be the maintenance plan once we build this wonderful facility. And uh, you would always do a feasibility study and find out that people, you know, this is our, all the culture of our country. We have to be short-term satisfaction and long-term bananas. You know, we just like don't think of the long-term. So parks is that long-term. Um, I heard so many things today that um, I'll resonate with. I had my first swimming lesson at Grant Park back when the earth was cooling in the 60s. And I'll never forget um, going there for those little, whatever I got these, I don't know, there was some cute name. Um, and uh, we'd jump in the pool in June. And June back then was always really Ambulance. cold. Yeah, in the morning. But um, so I think what I want to say is it's been a really jarring couple of weeks for, I think, the directors. You've been through this before. It's like, <laughs> hi, you're my fifth uh, commissioner in my X amount of years. So I, I'm i aware of that. And, uh, and on this end, it's also jarring because I really dove in and worked hard um, in the areas that I was focused on. And I have some PTSD from them because they were the ones that everyone's angry about. So um, my spouse who is a, has an MFA, is an artist, was like, babe, really push for arts and neighborhoods and parks and we need some joy in this house. <laughs> so, um, so I asked for this because <laughs> I basically was like, I needed to do some self-care and kind of be in a cheerleaderly uh, role again. 
Uh, and I'll always be like that. And I'll always have the courage to ask hard questions and more importantly to, to um, get things done and to partner with the amazing staff led by Director Long. And I will um, tell you that one thing I said to the mayor when we were doing these areas, and I was the one on the council that said, can we please have some strategic priorities for the city? Because it felt um, my first budget process was so line itemish. It's like, where's the big picture strategic priorities um, coming from an executive background? You just can't help to ask such questions. So that's when we got really clear about the fact that yes, homelessness, obviously, uh, which is really mental health, behavioral health systems that don't exist in our state. And then two was uh, community safety. And then three was economic uh, development. And all of that, all of that, <laughs> always with outcomes that are focused on equity. I don't like naval gazing equity. I like um, community-based equity. And I think ARCS gets to help the city demonstrate that and see what community outcomes for equity is as opposed to just what's happening within the city. And so I'm delighted um, to focus on that. That's what, what I did in my last gig at All Hands Raised was to wake up to the community about disparities and that if you don't have operational plans for equity, then the need, it's just not going to move. And if you don't measure it, then you probably aren't really taking it seriously. <laughs> so I'm looking forward to uh, never marginalizing what's most important in life, which I think is uh, what you get out of the microeconomies that exist in our neighborhoods, which include parks, which include schools, which include arts. Those are the microeconomies. So this is so economic development, but it's also community safety. And I know for me during, um, like for a lot of us, if it wasn't for going to the parks, then I don't know if we'd be able to take care of our own soul and um, in livability, of course. And so I think that we will work together to remind everybody that this is a major infrastructure bureau. Um, I love how passionate all of you are, you're great advocates. And I knew it was important for me to just listen to your quick, um, brief, crisp remarks about what's important to you. I really needed that. And it helps me pivot from the world that I was in, if you will, to, to this um, lane. And um, with that, um, I have 18 nephews and nieces and two of my nephews. And I have a tradition of going to a Blazer game. So I drive down from Seattle and they're like waiting for me at some establishment near the Moda Center. And so I kind of want to get there with my family. And, um, so that's why this is brief. But I, I want to make sure that these are in my calendar if you would like to be there. So. Yeah, well, we really do appreciate you coming by today to introduce yourself um, and to allow us to introduce ourselves to you. Um, I guess we look forward to, we typically do have a quarterly meeting with the board leadership team, which is myself, the co-chair, the chairs of the working groups, um, with the commissioner directly. We'd like to continue that, it's generally on a quarterly cadence, and we hope that whoever you are assigned as the liaison will come Karen, regularly. Karen. The, Karen, Karen. Karen. Okay. She's, she's out there to work. Um, <laughs> but we would hope that she can come, you know, as regularly as possible um, and also participate in our nominating committee process yeah. when we do our uh, selection of, of new board members and selection of leaders. Right. So that's what we would I hope. know as a former executive director, CEO of a nonprofit, I just loved the board because it was the place that I felt safe to bring some of the things that were keeping me up at night. And, and you were my strategic top partner. So we really need to keep it real like that so we can advocate together. And um, I want to also just end with this. So the rest of the portfolio, I was saying, I was saying this to you today, Director Long, you're like the, this is the mothership bureau. Yes, you, let, um, you refer to it as, yes. And then how, uh, <laughs> how the Office of Equity, how the uh, civic life, which um, is about neighborhoods, and uh, please don't tell me I'm missing something. Oh, the arts portfolio, how that all works into this, I think is so seamless. And um, all of that can move through the parks as a destination. Um, so I'm, I'm excited to connect the dots and make this cluster the one that really surprises people as the one that is, um, I think some people literally don't see it as the, in the three priorities. And uh, we're, gonna, we're gonna make sure when we go to those budget meetings um, that everyone's reminded that this is essential. Yeah, and as somebody that uh, was born and raised um, with um, some, we all have challenges, but mine was dyslexia. So if it wasn't for arts, and which of course arts and athletics, um, you know, that, that's how I was able to move forward in life. So I have a special attachment to um, play. Who said play? That was you. Yeah, 
we, are you connected with Playworks? Uh, yeah. yeah. Yeah, yeah. You sounded like somebody that, that works with Playworks. That's great. Um, anyway, I'm looking forward to playing with all of you. <laughs> and, um, and, and, and I look forward to it. And that's it. I better, I, I can feel my phone buzzing. Saying, okay. Where are you welcome, Danny? And you're welcome yeah. to come to our board meetings anytime. Yeah. Thank you for, Thank you for coming. Thank you. Thank you. We'll hold on to your name tags yes. for, yeah. for the next. Thank you so much for letting me in. Yeah, yeah thanks. All right. Oh, um, I also need to apologize to the board because I was so excited to get Commissioner Ryan up. I did not note that there was a change in the agenda, which I'm sure you all figured out by now. Um, since we were having the commissioner come by, we wanted to have him go first um, before we went into our business. And the other small change that we're making is that Mike Elliott is out of town and Ilana is filling in for him. Um, and providing a brief update on the financial sustainability working group activities. Any other changes that I should be aware of that we can inform everybody else about? Okay, uh, if that is it, we will move on to general announcements. Any general announcements from the floor? If not, we'll move to approving the December meeting minutes. I hope you all had a chance to review those minutes that were included in your board packet. Um, any discussion on those minutes? Any comments or corrections? If not, I will entertain a motion from the floor to approve the minutes as submitted. I'll move to approve them. Thank you, Aaron. Any second? Second. second. Oh, we got Adrian, Ali, and Casey all going for a second. So I'll let Michelle determine what happened there. Um, uh, any discussion? All in favor? Any opposition? Uh, any abstentions? I'll abstain. Sabrina is abstaining as well. Sabrina and Alejandro abstaining due to absence. Thank you. Uh, motion carries. Thank you. Um, director's report. Were we going to make a? I just have a couple of items, and um, I, I just want to note the um, the upcoming related council items that were listed at the bottom of your agenda. Um, one correction and one addition: um, the Urban Forestry Commission appointments will not be on January 18th. That's been pushed back. Um, and then the other thing I wanted to note is that on January 31st, um, OMF is. Um, presenting a work session called Citywide Infrastructure Investments, Findings and Recommendations. It is a work session, so it's not a public uh, comment opportunity, but I thought that this um, group would might be interested in knowing about that. Um, and then I just wanted to note that the Bureau monthly report was included in the packet as well, and just <coughs> wanted to pause for a moment, see if anyone had any questions about any of the entries. Being none, um, I would just move to uh, see the rest of my time to um, Alana and um, and Claudio for a BAC and financial sustainability update. Great, thank you. Any questions or comments for Director Long? Thank you. And just like that, we're back on time. Moving on to the working group reports, and most of these are going to be question and answer only. Um, Casey, Board Affairs. Oh, do, are there any questions? Does anybody have any questions? Yeah. <laughs> are there any questions for Casey on the Board Affairs working group um, report? Thank you, Casey. If not, we'll move on to the Land Use Infrastructure Working Group Report. Any questions for David? Now that report did come out late, as I recall, right? Is that the one that just came out? Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yes. The meeting was on Tuesday. Right. If there are none, we'll move on to Financial Sustainability Working Group. Um, and we didn't get a written report on that because the BAC meeting was just last night. And I know Claudio and Ilana had a brief update to provide us. Um, Ilana, are you prepared to give that? Or shall we 
So I'd love to have Claudio go over the details, but just as Bonnie said, the Financial Sustainability Working Group has been meeting as the Budget Advisory Council for the last month. We've had three meetings to look at the new investments, think about what the themes need to be, whether those investments meet our goals as, um, as the board and the goals of the Parks Bureau broadly. Um, the investments were all approved earlier this week, so we have given the thumbs up there from the committee level and are working on a letter to the council as a whole about the investments and the ask um, with the support from the Budget Advisory Council. Claudio, can you go over some of the specifics for the board? Yeah, you know, I actually uh, asked uh, Michelle to send the the slide deck from uh, from the December meeting. So that's probably the best place to go. I don't want to. I know that uh, this is just a Q and A component, so I don't want to go into uh, to all of those details. But just a couple of uh, a couple of quick notes. Um, you know, uh, we in the last couple of meetings we've talked about uh, director's guidance from July, uh, sort of the proposals that were developed in response to that guidance. Um, we talked about potential capital set aside requests, um, and then we had a sort of follow up discussion around performance measures uh, and the actions and results framework. And so, um, since that, uh, you know, since the December meeting, we actually got uh, the mayor's uh, mayor's budget guidance uh, and uh, the city budget office uh, forecast. So I'll note that uh, the forecast included uh, 6.5 million dollars in ongoing general fund that'll become available and uh, zero. Uh, in one time. Um, so 6.5 is not a big number. Um, and there's going to be a lot of competing, uh, competing um, uh, bureaus through, through the process. There, uh, over the last couple of years, city council has, uh, uh, has approved a lot of, uh, a lot of pr programs that are one-time funded, but likely have some ongoing constituencies. Uh, so they're going to be looking to incorporate those. So we really don't expect a lot to be happening in the general fund uh, and uh, they're, they're, they did direct us not to ask for any general fund requests uh, as part of the requested budget in January, and they're going to have a general fund process later on, and that's really mainly to accommodate uh, the shift in uh, the shift in, in bureau assignments and the new commissioner uh, onboarding. So, uh, as mentioned, we met yesterday uh, and we presented our final recommendations, which were largely what we talked about in December of course, with some of those tweaks to the general fund. So not requesting general fund as part of uh, the requested budget. So, uh, but, but as I said, uh, for details on, on all of that, uh, I would suggest uh, taking a look at the, uh, at the PowerPoint that, that was sent out. And I'm always happy to answer any questions by email and uh, can share answers with the whole group. So um, I'll leave it there unless anybody has any questions. Uh, any questions for Ilana and Claudio? I guess I'll just um, add that the BAC had the third of their three meetings last night. And um, I know that there is a process for letter writing at this point um, that some of us are participating in. I don't recall, Claudio, who volunteered. I know Randy was going to help review yeah. it, but I can't I recall. And then the um, labor rep on the back, oh, yes. whose name I am blanking on right now, Mark, I apologize. Mark, Mark. Thank Perfect. you, yes. Yeah. Thank you for helping me out. I couldn't remember from last night. Um, any questions? Thank you for that update, Alana and Claudio. Um, moving on to uh, the Community Engagement Working Group. Um, any questions for Aaron or Corbin on that report? <laughs> if not, we will move on to the foundation report. Randy. Hi, everyone. Um, I have two items I'd like to share with you. We're, um, working on uh, a charrette, uh, which is kind of a community visioning project with, uh, with PPR um, and PSU Center for Public Interest Design on O'Brien Square. Um, as you may have read, or maybe not, um, O'Brien Square, which has been fenced off for <clears throat> five years now, 
uh, is finally going to get uh, demolished. Um, but uh, you know, due to the way SDCs are sort of uh, cut and can only be used for expansion, there's really very little expansion opportunity there. So there's not much money to build a new, um, but we believe this is a, actually an opportunity, especially for such a, a complex site. Um, and uh, it has, of course, about a billion dollars of new development happening off of the southwest uh, corner um, and a whole cluster of social services um, on the northeast corner, uh, anchored um, most prominently by uh, the new um, Center for Behavioral Health, uh, or yeah, Behavioral Mental, Behavioral Health Resource Center, that's what it's called. Um, uh, the new county facility uh, uh, you know, there, and then also Central City Concern has some housing there, and New Avenues for Youth is there. Um, so it's a very, very complicated site socially um, and has very few of the things that would normally support a park directly adjacent. Um, the neighborhood has a, a lot of fiber underneath the ground. And so there's several buildings that are effectively just filled with computer servers. There's no people in them and no retail on the ground floor. Um, and so it's a very, very complicated site. And so this um, uh, PBOT, which will be overseeing the demolition, will be leaving it uh, quote unquote park ready, um, which will either be grass or crushed granite, um, they'll save as many trees as they can. Uh, and uh, so it'll be basically a, a kind of tabula rasa um, for that park, um, and which is sort of a scary notion in, in, in certain ways, um, you know, because of, you know, tents and all the, you know, social issues that we've been dealing with. Um, but we believe it's an opportunity to try some stuff out and see what works in this really complicated neighborhood. Um, and so uh, the Center for Public Interest Design at, at PSU um, is a really accomplished, um, effectively an architecture firm within an urban design firm within PSU. They've worked on a lot of um, uh, what's called term of art, uh, tactical activations of public spaces. They've worked extensively with TriMet. Uh, they've worked with the Sacramento Transit Agency, bringing you know, empty public spaces alive. And then through a fellowship program um, at Harvard that I was involved with some years ago, we're bringing in uh, some outside experts. Um, uh, the fellows work on each other's projects pro bono. And so we're bringing uh, a really wonderful uh, group of five folks out from different parts of the country. So um, they uh, you know, have a lot of experience in public space ranging from mental health in public space to youth empowerment um, and entrepreneurship in public space. Um, uh, community engagement. There's a, just a whole host of uh, uh, really great expertise that we'll be bringing. Um, the charrette will be March um, uh, 7th through the 11th. Um, and then in advance, we'll be doing a, a series of uh, happy hour Zoom talks with the visiting folks paired up with local folks, local experts um, around public space and some of the issues that downtown is facing. And uh, so we'll be doing a whole series of those and we'll have that in our newsletter on Thursday. I'm still buttoning down some scheduling stuff on that. So we're really excited about uh, the opportunity to, you know, give a new life to, you know, a square that's been troubled for a very, very long time, even before the fences, uh, you know, went up. It's, you know, got the nickname Paranoid Park or Needle Park. Um, and it's just a, a really sort of wicked urban problem. But um, we feel there's an opportunity to you know, create basically a series of, of programs that can inform a permanent design when the funds are available. Um, and, you know, we're going to do very, very wide outreach to um, all the, you know, various, you know, stakeholders involved in, in uh, uh, this area of town and, and beyond and bring some of the energy that we uh, cultivated with um, uh, Paseo, our festival that was uh, led by uh, a number of um, BIPOC creative and social justice leaders to the table. And, uh, and then also the you know, energy of the property owners who really want, have wanted something to happen there for a long, long time. So super excited about that. And then uh, at the other end of the spectrum, um, we're working on our next um, couple of friends and allies summits, uh, which bring various you know, parks, uh, representatives from various parks groups together. And I wanted to put out an opportunity to the board. Um, we um, 
to, these summits are guided by a steering committee um, and we have a couple of openings and it would be you know really great anybody would like to kind of get to know the work the grassroots work of the foundation a little better um, you know it's just a couple of meetings and uh, we pay stipends for it uh, and it's a great way to you know uh, see you know up close and personal some of the you know really great um, work that's being done uh, you know on the ground by many of our parks affiliate parks affiliated community groups um, and help you know, create programming for these summits that will uh, enable uh, better enable their work. So I'll um, put a, a a link to the outline for that, and uh, you can contact me if you're interested at all. We'd love to have a, you know some parks board um, members um, on that steering committee if there's any interest. Um, won't take up too much of your time, and we'll actually pay you. So, um, and I'm happy to answer any questions about either of those projects. Randy, looks like Adam has a question. Um, yeah, Randy, thanks so much for the update. That's really, frankly, exciting about O'Brien Square. I think it's a really cool opportunity. Um, you mentioned that the, the demolition is happening you know, fairly soon, and it sort of will be this blank canvas. What's sort of your timeline to bring in different community members, and when are you hoping to have um, you know, a few potential ideas of what that could look like? <clears throat> well, that's that's kind of what the charrette is about. We'll be doing some upfront work, um, you know, bringing people you know to the table in various ways. Um, the charrette, as I said, will be March seventh through the eleventh. So we'll have you know public interaction, you know, where you can just come in, walk off the street. Um, but we'll also have focus groups around um, you know key areas of, of uh, you know uh, interest um, to you know really get good ideas on the table. And then uh, that that will largely happen on uh, March sixth, um, and then uh, or, excuse me, um, March eighth, uh, and then on March 9th and tenth, uh, the CPID, the Center for Public Interest Design, and um, the Loeb Fellows will really go to work, you know, synthesizing those and sort of coming up with some, you know, some you know strong ideas that emerge out of these conversations. And then we'll present them on the final day, a Saturday forum uh, to the public and, you know, get, you know, them crit critiqued and, and uh, you know, further shaped. Uh, and then that will evolve into a report that, that PSU will do. Um, so the, the central, um, you know, public engagement will really be happening, um, you know, during those days. Uh, so we're gonna, you know, try to get as many people at the table as we can. I'm working out what space we're going to be in. I'm hoping we're going to be in a, in a storefront space right next to the park. Um, but we'll be doing really wide outreach on that. And, and uh, I'll you know, certainly circulate it to the board so you can uh, you know, reach out to your networks um, you know, to bring people in. Does that answer your question? Yeah, thanks. Yeah. And if you have feedback on any of this, I mean, I'm giving you the... Uh, you know, if you want to talk about any of it, I'm happy to, you know, um, hop on a call or, you know, engage in an email exchange because uh, uh, I'm just giving you the highlights because of time. Thanks, Randy. It looks like Adrian has a question. Yeah. Um, thanks a lot, Randy. Um, we heard about this in land use and infrastructure as well from you briefly. And I came away wondering, and I realize this will be addressed by the charrette and other processes, which is great. But you know, how we effectively deal with a situation where there's not enough money to fully develop the space, right? And mm -hmm. so you'll do something, but how do you prevent sort of misuse and going in the wrong direction with the rest of the space? And I'm just wondering if Parks has experience with that. Um, and, you know, Florin has experience or others. Um, and I think it's probably a situation that we have had experience with and will, so. Yeah, I mean, you know, it's a, obviously this kind of programming is sort of an evolution and it's gonna, you know, uh, what we hope is, you know, money will follow good ideas. Um, you know, we're gonna try to, you know, um, cultivate some foundation interest in it because, um, you know, I, I wouldn't say that other than dealing, you know, with houselessness and some, um, you know, mental issues through grants, the philanthropic community has not been super uh, involved in, in uh, you know, trying to bring downtown back. 
and I think that there's an opportunity here for a philanthropic, uh, you know, support of, of, of programs. It's, uh, you know, through, through the arts and creativity, um, you know, as far as the kind of security issue, that's, that's a more, um, you know, challenging topic that, you know, we'll have to, you know, sort of evolve. I mean, obviously there's been, you know, issues around the food cart pod at, Ank at Ankeny Plaza, um, and, you know, there's general, you know, issues. I mean, Pioneer Courthouse Square is vandalized almost every night. So, yeah. um, you know, it's, it's, you know, we will have to, you know, figure this out. And part of it will be, you know, beginning a conversation, I think, around the management of, of all three squares eventually. Uh, I think that's something that really needs to happen. How much we can accomplish in this charrette, you know, I think we can get ideas and programs to seek funding. We can get conceptual designs for the long term, um, and and we can start a conversation about the management of the downtown, um, you know, urban plazas. Uh, so that's that's really in a sense our goals. So that's sort of an indirect answer to your question, but you know, work in progress. Thanks. Thank you. And Any other questions? PCR, please weigh in here. Um, I'm sort of talking a little bit out, out over my skis. Thank you for that thorough report, Randy, um, and addressing questions. Um, let's go ahead and move on to the Charter Commission um, phase two proposals. Casey. Thank you, Bonnie. Um, as you all may remember, um, a Charter Review Commission was appointed to review and suggest revisions to the city's charter. Um, the recommendations would come in two phases. The first phase was what we voted on in November. <laughs> Um, phase two pertains to various changes to the charter that did not pertain to the city's form of government. In the phase two recommendations, the commission has recommended a change to that part of the city charter, which is chapter 12, that deals with parks. Those changes are reflected in um, section 12-01 that I sent out yesterday. It's small print, but I hope you had the opportunity to read it. Um, the changes are to basically broaden the charges to reflect what parks is actually doing to include forests, wetlands, and other natural areas, and to clarify language um, in the existing uh, charter. The rec recommendations are to go before the city council on January 19th. After council, uh, consultation with Director Long, the Board of Affairs Working Group voted to recommend to the board that the board take steps to support the council's approval of the changes by letter, by appearance, or both. Um, Director Long, I don't know if you have anything else that you'd like to include here. Uh, no, just that I put this in. And I can't hear you. She was having audio issues. Okay. You might, I thought I was. Yep, sorry about that. There you go. Um, yeah, so I just um, I shared my screen um, so that folks could see the charter language that was approved in November 2022, and then the language that is going to be referred by the Charter Commission and will be um, is, is being uh, voted on for January 19th. So it's on the screen if folks want to uh, take a look at it. And I would say just generally, um, our hope was to include some uh, natural area and green infrastructure that was previously left up out of the um, initial description. Um, so you, I think you'll see that reflected uh, in, oh, there it goes. I just got booted, sorry. You'll see it reflected in the language. I'll try to get back on. Todd, do you have anything to add? Yeah, it's really just modernizing the language. And when there was written, this section was written in the charter for Portland Parks and Recreation, we just didn't have the language around green infrastructure and the importance of ecosystem services, the importance of nature to humans, like it just wasn't. And so it was really talking about hard infrastructure and parks. So it's really just expanding the language the way we all talk about it today. <clears throat> so there's not a material difference of what this, our scope is. Doesn't change. Does any other member of the Board of Fairs Working Group have any um, contributions, additions? Um, Bonnie, I'm prepared to make a motion. I don't know if you want to have a discussion before. Um, I can open it up for discussion, um, or I can open it up to whatever anyone on the board wants to do. 
I would entertain a motion if one was made. We often provide an opportunity for discussion after a motion is made. So it's up to you. I'll like make a motion then. Um, I'd like to make a motion to authorize the board chair, vice chair, and members and or members of the board affairs working group to write such letters and to make such appearances before the city council as they deem appropriate to support the passage of the charter commission phase two recommendation changes as they pertain to parks. Um, have to give a little attitude in order to make this work um, to the people who are drafting or appearing. Uh, can I hear a second, anyone? Second. Thank you. Discussion. Can I ask for a vote? You can call the question, yes. Oh, I'd like to call the question. Bonnie, do you do this do I? <laughs> What's that? Do you do this? Do you do you ask for the vote or do I? Um, I think technically I do, but you have there the floor, so I think it's fine. <laughs> all right, good. Um, uh, I'm all pretty in, easy going. <laughs> all in favor of the motion, um, signify by raising your hand or saying aye. I'm raising my hand. I can't see anything. And all oppo any opposed? Motion carries. I appreciate all your um, help on this. Thank you. Thank you, Casey. Um, anything else on that topic? Any wrap up that so that we would authorize uh, the working group and the board to uh, advocate for those changes? Um, and are you writing a letter as well? Yeah, I'll go and circulate back to you and the members of the board affairs working group about um, uh, drafting a letter. Okay, perfect, perfect. Um, and you're going to work directly with the work, board affairs working group, so you don't need volunteers from the from the rest of the board right now, right? Correct. Okay, terrific. Thank you. Okay, with that, we're moving on to the policy framework. Melody. <laughs> Today we have uh, Melody Brooks uh, with us, who's going to. Um, <laughs> Uh, provide some information to the board on the uh, Portland Parks and Recreation Policy Framework. This will be a discussion and we'll, we will be asking for feedback um, from the board. Thank you. Melody, floor is yours and hopefully you can keep your internet. Yes, we've both been booted twice. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> we've been kicked off. Okay, Melody, you're on mute. Hello everyone, my name is Melody and I'm the Chief Policy Analyst. I'm also a member of the ENI team supervised by Kenya. And today I'm excited to talk about the policy framework. This is something that um, is the result of conversations and analyzing um, our current policy practices and where we would like to go in the future. So the goal is to create a policy system um, where uh, the policies and the standards, uh, standard operating procedures are stored in a central location. And this is important for um, sharing information um, so that staff can access. This is important for onboarding. It's also important for um, transparency. Um, if a member of the public has a question about our policies or our standards, we're not only able to show them what we're currently following, but um, uh, the standards that we've had in the past as well. And so as we begin to um, do more education and training around our policy and standards, uh, having this system will be very helpful. This also helps with uniformity. Uh, we have divisions that have overlapping work. So it's important to resolve any conflicts we have in those standards. And just to have a, um, a process, a policy process that the staff are aware about. And we, um, if, if there's any new policy <laughs> projects, we have, um, we have a process that we have uh, decided on and bureau leadership has approved uh, to make sure that we have a good policy and collaborative pro policy process. So I'm gonna go over a little bit of our, um, our definitions, uh, our inventory process that we'll be doing this spring and then the, the actual policy process. So some important definitions um, to talk about the, the hierarchy of, of law and policy in our bureau, uh, the city charter, which we've been, we were just talking about. That is of course the organizing document of the city government. Uh, we have the code, which is the local law adopted by council and it also implements the charter. And then we have the city administrative rules that enforce code and policy. 
And then we have the Bureau Administrative Rules, which are similar, but they're uh, adopted by the director and city forester, and they are binding citywide, just like the city administrative rules are. So of course, at the top, we have the federal and state law, then the city code and charter. And as I stated, uh, the city administrative rules and bureau administrative rules are both binding, binding on Portlanders and city staff. And then what I'll be talking more about today is the policy. And the policy, although um, um, park staff and, um, and visitors that come to our facilities, uh, they have to abide by the policies, is not binding on um, staff citywide. So then the direction that we have for policy for our new framework is to have policy at a very high level. It's gonna be focused on our values. Um, it's going to be something that does not change often. Um, our changes are gonna come um, with more detail with our standard operating procedures, but we're going to focus on broad and, and general positions that we have on policy and um, what is our position, what is our stance on particular matters and it was, it's going to give um, a strategy for decision making um, and how to um, implement our programming and services in the Bureau. As far as um, having more specific actions, we're going to, uh, that's going to be reserved for our standard operating procedures. Right now, uh, a lot of our policies have a little bit of both. They have a lot of um, steps and specific actions and then also like the values all in one thing. We want to have a, a clear separation between the two. That way, our policies are not going to be changed as often because they're going to be in line with our values. And then our standard operating procedures, we can change and update that if new, back, new best practices come out, for example. So the difference between a policy and a standard operating procedure, a policy explains why. Why are we doing this? Again, it communicates the organization's values, philosophy, and position. And a standard operating procedure, procedure answers how. Um, this, uh, this details who is responsible and what are the step-by-step -step instructions. So ideally, if there's a task that has to be performed in, a, in the Bureau, I should be able to look at a standard operating procedure and have a clear understanding of beginning to end, what steps do I have to take? Who do I need to talk to? What approvals do I need to make? Um, what approvals do I need to get before I go to the next step and to have the step completed? And the, diff and the differences between practice and pro um, process, practice is a regular activity that you do and the process is the detailed instruction on how you implement that practice. So we have a practice that we're developing for collaborative decision-making and collaborative policy-making uh, and so that practice is that a collaborative decision making and the process is the detailed uh, steps on how we're going to involve uh, the community and internal stakeholders and um, subject matter experts that actually work on that particular issue every day in parks. So as I stated earlier this spring, we're going to do an inventory on our major policies and standard operating procedures. Uh, so the policies are, are located in many different places right now. Um, as you're, you're aware, we have folks who have worked in the Bureau for a long time. Some of them have committed to memory. So it's really important that we have it, that we're able to store it all in one place. And so the first uh, step, uh, uh, Director Long is uh, directed us to upload the existing policies that we have. I have access to um, a, a good bit of the policies on, uh, on the book at the um, auditor's office. And then we're going to direct uh, division staff to designate responsible um, policy uh, point persons, points of contact, and they are going to um, receive training and instruction from me because it's important that uh, we have this new understanding of what a policy is and what an SOP is, and we all are on the same um, page. It's going to require education and a little bit of training, and that way we're, we're making sure that we're not collecting oranges when we really want apples. So um, this, that will be an important part in talking to the staff and preparing them for the inventory. 
And then we will have a, a survey attached to uh, uploading. We're considering smart sheets and as SharePoint as well, because we believe that will be more accessible. And then once that is uploaded, then um, later this year, we will um, do an analysis. Um, and so we can see where the gaps are, or where we need new policy projects. So this is the, um, so now I'm gonna talk about the process, but first the roles. And these are the roles that uh, staff, key policy staff uh, play in the Bureau. So we have Director Long who will be um, adopting policies and administrative rules and <clears throat> Uh, Deputy Director Lawfren will be managing the policy agenda and direction. We'll also be working with leadership to uh, uh, develop a policy docket on what um, what what projects uh, have priority. Uh, our equity manager will be reviewing the policy for equity, community, and civil rights considerations. Um, I'll be ensuring that the policy plan and drafts are on task. We're doing that right now with uh, our our cost recovery policy process, where uh, we're develop, we're reviewing research first and we're talking to internal stakeholders and then we'll be um, developing a draft um, with someone who is a subject matter expert and is um, doing a lot of the meeting and the reviewing um, to make sure that the policy addresses uh, past concerns and um, work that has already been done and is where we want to go in the future. As far as the divisions go, the division manager will be um, setting the agenda for requests and um, supervises division policy work. So requests will be sent to the director's office to approve for a policy project. And then we have the policy author, and this is like the main point person who, so let's say we have a policy um, being developed in the division, the person who works, um, works on that subject or who has been designated by the uh, division manager, they will be the policy author and I will work with them and, um, through the director's office to make sure that that policy project is on task and in line with what we, uh, the vision we have. And then the internal and external stakeholders are of course a part of this process as well because they're gonna provide subject matter expertise on why the policy needs to change, why the policy wasn't effective, We've learned that with our cost recovery policy, why folks, um, what, what was holding folks back from actually using it and, um, and provide um, input on how this could impact their work and impact the community. So as you can see here, this is the policy development uh, process. It's important that Throughout the process, we'll, we will be on major policies. We will be working with the board and bringing um, topics, uh, policy, uh, policy dockets, um, drafts, and um, before we have a final um, version of the policy to, to be uh, signed by the director. So you will be involved in this process as well. Um, internally inside the bureau, um, it will start with uh, the division manager <laughs> approving a policy request to submit to the director's office. Uh, the director's office reviews and um, reviews the request and then is signed to a policy author. The author and the policy analyst will meet to discuss a plan and timeline. And this includes uh, community engagement um, and stakeholder engagement, which includes uh, the parks board, of course. And then the author researches and consults, um, researches and consults internal and external state stakeholders. So there's usually a reason why a policy project comes up. Um, maybe the current policy wasn't addressing all the concerns. Maybe there's a better way to approach the work. So during this research process, that's when we're going to review and make sure that that the new policy actually is effective. We had a great um, conversation uh, yesterday uh, regarding cost recovery with um, our the folks who have been working on um, the fee waiver policy process. And so there's a lot of ways in which those policy processes overlap. And we want to make sure that um, they complement each other and that one doesn't conflict with the other. So that's an important part of the process. Um, then we start to get into the writing and drafting and it's reviewed by the division manager and then it's submitted to the director's office for a final review. And that's when we can bring that policy back here for any last comments. And then it's approved. 
It's approved and it's signed by the director and it's recorded with the auditor's repository because all policies, all official policies of the bureaus should be on record with, at the auditor's office. And so when we, um, I, when I showed you that the equity manager will be reviewing for equity and civil rights considerations, here are some of the things that uh, the ENI team and other equity practitioners will be uh, reviewing the policies and um, processes for um, using the equity and anti-racism lens um, to see if this uh, policy aligns with that. Uh, the Healthy Parks, Healthy Portland uh, uh, strategic framework, mission, vision, values, as well as the city core values that were passed and then laws, civil rights laws. They have to be in accordance with Title II and Title VI to make sure that we're com in compliance with that. And this, in this type of analysis and also stakeholder engagement needs to be from the beginning, during the planning process, throughout the process, and also in implementation, because it's important that implementation mirrors the, um, the spirit of the policy and, and all the great feedback that we got. So the director does have rulemaking authority. This is directly what we were talking about with um, the, the Bureau Administrative Rules. And um, the director has this authority from chapter 17. It requires the director to give public notice of why um, uh, administrative rule is um, being implemented and it has to obviously carry out the, the, um, the, goals, in, uh, the goals of parks according to the, the charter. The city forester also has rulemaking authority uh, through Title 11. And so this is um, directly stated in the city code, the city charter. Thank you. <laughs> <laughs> thank you, Melody. Um, I see Allie's tent up and Chris's. Yeah, uh, thank you for the presentation and great work. Um, just a quick question in the roles. I didn't see, I'm wondering what the process is like once it's done for internal communications, who's in charge of, right, the broad launch? And I mean, I'm guessing there's a lot of policies, there's a lot of things in park. So how does that actually filter down into your many, many, many staff folks? Yeah, so we're, the ENI team is currently working with the comms team. And so we're developing a plan of what that looks like to make sure that it gets to staff, especially field staff, and so that everyone understands like the new policies and the ones that we have on record. And so that that is um, another part to to be announced. So that will go under roles as well. Of, of the communication, yes, in the future. Cool. Yes. Mm -hmm. Ali, um, seeing as though this is your area of expertise, if you have. Any ideas about what that might look like or things that we might want to watch out for? We're really open to, to hearing any feedback you have. Yeah, I'll reach out. I know, I mean, it's, it's internal communications are super complicated and it's always a challenge of, right, the decisions made on the upper levels and how it gets down to the community. So, um, but yeah, great work. Thanks, yes, uh, just some of the um, ideas that we've had, we've been considering like quarterly updates where we talk about all the new policies that were just adopted. Uh, we've talked about pop-ups, we talked um, and actually going to work sites and talking about these things. And we've also talked about um, um, illustrations, graphics similar to this one. So it's easily explained, especially more complex policies and standard operating procedures. So we're working to see what, what um, what ideas will actually catch people's attention? Because as I've said it before, that policy it can be one of those things where you don't want to read all the wording. Um, but we do want to get it across so that we we're in compliance and people know what the the latest standard is. Thank you, Melody. Uh, Chris, these are two oddly specific questions. One is about like a policy analysis worksheet, especially because I think this is going to be a lot of information for community members um, to engage in. So just thinking about having um, a possible policy worksheet that it has like a fiscal impact and you have one or two sentences, equity impact and, and break those down and possible communications. Um, has there, I, I know that's really oddly specific in the process and you might not be there yet, but has there been any thinking around that? 
that's definitely a part of um, our communications plan is how do we communicate to the one of the reasons why we want the system uh, so that we can have more transparency and we can collaborate more with the community. So that will definitely be part of it. And I think that's a great idea to just give um, quick points of, of why, why it should matter and how it could change things um, for programs and services. And my second question is about the database of um, things being uploaded and searchable. Is that going to be a more internal tool or it will be internal and external? And the reason I ask this is just because in doing massive policy migration and integration and pulling things apart to create something new for more alignment is there's a lot of historical information and decision making that might get lost or jumbled around. So it it's a, just a great resource for internally and externally. Um, but I wasn't sure what the intent of just having that uploading all of those things um, and documents was more internal or external as well? Well, right now we're starting internally because um, we, the policies aren't even in a central location yet. Um, but once we have that, we have a foundation and it's organized and it's labeled, then that's when we can start to figure out uh, how do we share this information and how do we make it available for the public? This is really exciting. She's, she's not joking. Person. Literally, when I came in, when I came in, I had a binder, and they were like, "Here's the policies." Like, what? <laughs> and they were like, three directors ago, sign, sign." Yeah. So it's a big job. We're really yeah. excited about it. <laughs> Thank you. Uh, I think Corbin, then Aaron, then um, Sabrina and Paul. Casey, you put your hand down. Is that correct? <laughs> Alejandro also. Oh, Alejandro, I'm sorry, I missed you. But I think Corbin, you I think you were next, Corbin. I I have a question around this wheel. It only goes one direction. And my question is, is it possible for it if the board sees some policies or opportunity to bring something forward? Yeah. Can it be looped back? And what would that process look like? Well, I think it's an iterative thing. So I think at any point the board could uh, could identify where there's potential for either new or re-examined policy. So yeah, I would just say it's more of an iterative as opposed to going both ways. Okay, I was just wondering if, if, if it's something that we can initiate if yeah. we're seeing. Okay, thank you. I would hope so. <laughs> But thank you for pointing that out. And maybe we need to make that more explicit in our presentation too. I have a second question because you, you said title two and six. Um, and I'm wondering, are you also considering title nine of thinking about discrimination based on gender, sex and things of, the, of that nature? Is that also being incorporated here? Yes, it's, to, it's all the, so title two, title six, title nine, title 23, that's the, title 23 is the uh, local, uh, civil rights law, and it's it it it's a uh, I think it's ten protected classes. So civil rights considerations generally state, local, federal. And unfortunately, ADA doesn't tend to go under civil rights sometimes, and they end up being this particular community ends up being placed in different and not necessarily centered. And are you centering them as well? Yes, we are. We are. Um, Title II is a major focus of the work that we do on the ENI team. And unfortunately, there are people who do uh, separate uh, ADA, but ADA is a civil rights law. Uh, so that is a part of the civil rights considerations. Just a suggestion, if you're going to take this presentation out to the community, to make sure that that language is there and visible to go over with them. Thank you. Thank you, Erin. Um, first, thank you. That was a great presentation. I have a few like very basic questions and then maybe a comment. The first is, um, is there a difference between a policy and an administrative rule? Yes. Okay. Yes. And maybe I missed, missed that during the presentation, but so the administrative rule is above the policy. Yes. Okay. Here it is. Okay. Thank you. That, <laughs> yes. Thank you. Right. That was at the beginning. Okay. I just wanted to kind of clarify that, but the director sets the administrative rules, but also the policies through the director too. They're just like a little bit under the administrative rules. Yes. Okay. Um, and then I'm curious, like when we're talking about policies, I know part of this is organizing all of them, but what is the volume? Is there an estimate of how many policies there are out there? 
I honestly, I honestly wouldn't want to just because I would really just be pulling a number. Yeah, uh, that's one of the reasons why we're doing this right. inventory because we want to see like how many policies and, and if we see like a much lower number in an area than it needs to be or a much higher number yeah. in the area that's where there's like redundancies, uh, then that will show us where um, in our during our gap analysis where we need to focus on. Mm -hmm. Again, and then um, along those same lines, I guess I'm wondering talking about like revising policies or adding new policies, that kind of thing. What, just looking at that circle, I'm wondering what is the volume of that? Do you have a projection? I, and maybe, maybe I need to step back a minute, which is, is the drive for this to really organize or is the drive to change? Once we organize, it will be easier to change. Yeah, okay. Um, I, I guess I'm just, and I, maybe this is more of a comment than a question. Looking at that circle, I'm wondering, I, it'd be interesting to know how what the volume is that would be going through that circle, how to make it meaningful, what are the kind of um, levels, what goes where, does everything go through that circle? I think those might be additional information that would be helpful for us to see. Yes. Um, and then also if, if it gets to the point where the drive is to change, just thinking about that change management, how people handle change, if this is that process. And anyway, so those are really my comments, but thank you. Thank you. That's something that I'm trying to keep in mind as well already with, I mean, having the framework, this framework is already a change. Yeah. And so we have things that uh, that were needing to roll out. I was having a great conversation with the park safety team, for example, and there was something that they were already rolling out for the winter that needed to be, uh, and that needed to go out um, immediately. And it wasn't something, well, oh, well, actually, let's rethink the whole, you know, yeah. it needs to be, we need, it needs to be practical and, um, and giving time uh, for folks to pivot. And so we're already starting to do that change management and implementing the framework. Thank you, Melody. Uh, Sabrina. Hi, I had a question um, and maybe it's a clarifying question. So I know you talked about that database um, to kind of collect and see everything that's out there. Is that something that like staff are gonna be able to uh, um, access just throughout the time of, of their employment at parks? Because I'm sure there's gonna be a really big uh, communication efforts of like rolling this information out, but like how do staff throughout the life of their time, um, just go back and reference these? Is that what this database is or do they have to go to like somewhere else? Well, that's, yes, that's the goal. The goal is that it will be easy to share in access so that if um, a staff member wants to know what a policy or, or standard is that they have a central location to refresh, to learn, to share for other employees for reference, that's the goal. Okay, cool. Thank you. Thank you, Paul. Thank you. Um, I have three questions. Yeah, obviously, I understand the importance of consistent policy framework. So these might sound like a little bit off, but how much of this is compliance driven versus how much of it is operations driven? And what's the sense of the magnitude of change or the level of change or streamlining that will result from having finally a consistent policy framework? So I think that it's both, uh, both um, compliance and operations because we it's hard to be in compliance with something if you don't have, uh, you don't have the, uh, the, re the record of what the policy actually is or what folks are actually following. And there, there could be um, records of certain policy, policies and SOPs that are on the books that folks may not be following because there's not a central location to access it. So I think that it will be um, both um, operations and um, compliance driven. And then um, what was your last question again? How will it change things moving forward? Um, I think okay. that it's not gonna be an immediate change uh, but I think that it will slowly begin to improve um, our processes and our review. And um, I think it will also help with how we are expanding as a bureau now and onboarding new folks. Thank you. Alejandro, are you, 
You're okay. Casey, your hand up went up and down a couple times. You're okay. Uh, I'm, I, I appreciate everyone's indulgence for a bizarre question. I'm just wondering um, uh, if it is possible or if it's um, uh, advantageous to slightly tweak the decision support tool and stick it in the circle so it's being used as part of the process. You want me to jump in? Yes. That? Yeah, that might so, be a question for Todd, actually. <laughs> so the um, the uh, equity and anti-racism lens has seven principles, and those same seven principles are being used in the decision support tool. And so, and I, I think we're accomplishing that so far. So we'll be looking at policies in the context of those seven principles. Decision support tools got a little bit of a tweak on it because we also look at kind of geographic coverage around race, income, other demographic factors. And that might be applicable to some policies. And so I think, you know, we could use that type of information. So like, I think it's good input for our team to think about like when it's applicable, we could use it. Thank you. Yes, Ali and Chris both have questions again. Mine is just a quick sort of recommendation plus question. I know comms is understaffed in general, right? Tim has mentioned that it's a pretty stretched thin. Um, if you guys don't have an internal communications manager, I would highly recommend you hire one for just how complex the organization is and how much information you need to move through in smart ways. Do you have an internal call? We, oh, we just finally <laughs> hired. <laughs> 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 so, yeah. Never mind. Great news. <laughs> for the first time since we've been here, we've got a fully staffed comms team. Perfect. Yeah. yeah. That's great. And when I arrived, that was one of the first questions I asked my first week of like, who's doing internal comms and centrally? in the director's office and the answer was no one. Wow. So like we've come a long way to <laughs> Thank you, Levy. having a comms team. Great. <laughs> uh, and then my question was just, you mentioned that, that the policies are meant to be broad and are going to be aligning with the values that mentioned that, that it will have equity and the anti-racism lens and then pointed to like healthy parks and healthy Portland. Um, those plans, like what are the actual values and principles, all of them that you want to align to, like in one place? And are there is there a list generated? Well, we are very close. Okay. You'll be hearing about mission, vision, values, and racial equity commitment in the in the coming months. So yeah, we're we're this close. But we have we have values that we've identified prior to that process. But I think we're the idea is to use the ones mm -hmm. that are being generated from our, our healthy parts. Well, thank you, Melody, and thank you, everybody, for your questions. Um, I think we'll move on to Title 20 proposed amendments in case people are not tired of governance yet. <laughs> um, Victor, and I saw Vicente was um, online, but I will turn it over to Victor. Yeah. Do you want to stand or do you want to sit? No, it's like Todd. Okay. Swap one for one. See if you know your friends. You guys are matching. Uh, <laughs> yeah. We're waiting for spring. I know. We're ready. We're ready. Well, thank you all for having us. I've, yeah, more governance work. But as Melody had mentioned, you know, this is some work that's been on the docket for quite some time, but we haven't had staff capacity to really uh, tackle it yet. So I have with me today Cameron Simmons, who's our PSU Hatfield Fellow, who's been helping us with some of the grounding work we've been doing uh, on this project. So uh, Title 20 is the city code for all of our park rules. It encompasses a variety of other items. Uh, it used to include language around, or rather it still does, um, just around permitting and what's allowed in parks, what's not allowed in parks, uh, roles and responsibilities of, of those folks that work within parks. So what we're doing today is we are gonna review what those ranger roles and responsibilities are look at some of the tools rangers use to enforce and educate on those park rules in Title 20, discuss some of those current challenges, and examine the opportunities to, the, to, uh, to improve those rules and those tools that have been on our docket for quite some time, and then talk about ways to involve you all uh, in this project. And Vicente, I believe, is with us. I think I may have seen him, so he can uh, chime in at any time if, if I might miss something. 
Uh, so rangers are, are non-sworn park rule enforcement. So they are not police, they are civil enforcement um, individuals that go out and help us uh, with any of the park rules and any issues that we have in parks. We have 24 full-time uh, park rangers and we up uh, we bring on up to 17 seasonals uh, in the summer seasons. So that's typically March through uh, September, November. They patrol all 12,000 acres and 280 parks. So you can imagine how stretched thin they can be on any given summer day. In 2021, so that's for the calendar year of 2021, we responded to 1,800 calls for service. So those are folks that actually call 823-1637. You can put that in your phone if you like. Somebody will be friendly on the other side answering to take your call uh, and resolved over 8,000 park rule issues. And we now have, thank you, Vicente. It's already chiming in with, with the corrections on the presentation. We're always hiring. Yeah, we're, exactly. <laughs> so they were they uh, rangers resolved over eight thousand park rule issues, and that includes both uh, proactive, so going out, they're patrolling parks every single day of the week, from uh, seven a.m. all the way through twelve thirty a.m., as well as a couple graveyard slit shifts. So those are folks that are going out and they're seeing issues in the field, and they're going out and they're engaging folks. One of the really important pieces I want to point out here is that 98% of all of our contacts are resolved without police or fire intervention. So that's a really big feather in the cap for the program is that we train, we have a four to five week training program depending on the season where we put folks through uh, basically educational enforcement approaches to how to engage folks on why it's important for both the visitor experience and our natural resources um, to not break park rules, right? And in most cases, we are able to uh, you well. In most cases, we're able to then just use education to um, to gain the compliance that we need. So, what are those issues that rangers typically handle? Well, they're civil and non-criminal in nature. So, folks have heard of Portland Street Response. You may have heard some language that they've used, which we use as well, is that we're not going out on calls where there are threats of weapons or threats of violence. These are really civil, non-criminal issues that are impacting, again, the visitor experience and the resources of the park. These might be things like smoking in a park, lighting off fireworks, unpermitted large events that are impacting the park, right? We're talking large events, not just somebody taking over, you know, a picnic area. Dumping household or commercial garbage is an issue for us. Park closure problems, as I mentioned, we have graveyard rangers that do, uh, that are out in the field throughout the evening, making sure folks are not in parks after hours. Abandoned vehicles and boats. Removal of rose bushes. Uh, folks might, uh, if you've ever been in North Park Blocks or the Written National Rose Test Garden, you might have seen those signs that say $500 fine for removing rose bushes. There's no record of us ever issuing a $500 fine for removing a rose bush, but we actually do have problems where folks are uh, physically digging up some of the, the test roses, roses in the rose garden. So it's, it's a thing. Um, behavior issues that are impacting the visitor experience, dog off leash issues is one of our number one -ish problems. Graffiti and maintenance problems, they're responding to calls about any type of issues in parks that might be maintenance related. And then operating a business without a permit. And these are things that are uh, complex. Uh, and sometimes they're combined. We had a call this week out at Kelly Point Park um, of an individual that's been out there several times with um, six to 10 dogs that's actually operating a doggy daycare out of the park, right? And so that's an example of two problems all in one uh, that rangers would go out and resolve. <laughs> And then drones and a variety of other things within Title 20 um, that affect us in parks. And again, these are civil and typically non-criminal issues. So how do we how do rangers typically solve those problems? Number one, as you saw, 98% of the time is generating voluntary compliance. So they're going out with leave no trace principles. They're going out and uh, helping folks understand how this is impacting the park experience or the recent natural resources. The second thing that we do if it rises to that is ejections or exclusions. These are paperwork that require you to leave the park for 30, 60, or 90 days, depending on the, the violation type. In most cases, it doesn't rise to this. Um, we issue, I believe it's less than 100 of those annually for all of the park issues that we're responding to. In some cases, ejections or exclusions might not work and we have to disengage. And these sometimes minor problems have to be routed to police. And part of this work and part of the why is that we feel that many of these issues really don't rise to the need of, of uh, requiring police intervention and that rangers should have the tools necessary to resolve those without having to route it to PPB. We do have some limited authority in Title 20 to issue citations, but those are only for dog issues. And the current code and administrative rule, as Melody had mentioned, is currently written in a way that requires us to issue a warning first. That can be really difficult when you're talking about a populations of you know, hundreds of thousands of folks that may have dog off leash um, 
uh, prior interactions. So these tools fall short in really three ways. Restitution, we want to make sure that if folks are damaging the park, that parks is being made whole for any of the damage that might happen. Resolution, we want to make sure that we are uh, engaging folks into positive behavior. We want to get people in a pipeline where if they are having an unpermitted event or something's happening in a park, we want to make sure that we uh, move them in a way that's positive that gets them to issue the correct permit to make sure they're not impacting others in the park or the neighborhood. And deterrence. Things like commercial garbage dumping, exclusions don't necessarily work in that when it's a business that's doing the dumping, right? We need another mechanism in order to resolve that type of issue. So we have a limited mechanisms right now to dis uh, discourage that repeat type of behavior. So what we're looking to do right now in Title 20 as we work through this grounding and discovery phase is solidify that ranger role and responsibility in city code. Rangers really didn't start uh, in the Parks Bureau until about 2012. There's some small iterations of, iterations of seasonals working prior to that, but the current form of our program wasn't until 2012, so it's a relatively new program for the, for the city, uh, which is really exciting because we have time to craft this and think through it. We want to update code for clarity and compliance with uh, new state and local laws and also just uh, add some plain language. If you've read through Title 20, uh, there's a variety of things in there that are just really outdated. Uh, Cameron's been having a really fun time going through that. You're not allowed to bounce a ball in Pinehurst Square, right? Like, what are you talking about? Um, sneezing in a bathroom is prohibited. Like, it's it's very it can be interpreted that way, right? And so there's a variety of things that need to be updated. Um, and then establishing civil penalty options instead of the court system, again, for some of those violations where we feel it's important for us to be able to take care of that ourselves uh, in-house rather than have to take it uh, to another agency like Portland Police where something would have to be routed through the court system. And then finally, we want to make sure that we're creating opportunities for community engagement on rangers and public safety generally for our parks. I'm not going to run through all of these. This isn't all encompassing. There's a variety of things in here that are, there's a variety of things that are not in here, like around administrative rules, as Melody had mentioned. There's a variety of things with park hours, uh, who's considered, uh, or rather where you can smoke, things like that inside those administrative rules that also require some updating. And there's just a variety of things that um, are currently outdated. Fires and fireworks, for example, you're still technically allowed to have fireworks in parks, except for the director, except for where the director says you're not. That's currently at odds with the fire code, which currently says there's no fireworks allowed in parks. So there's a few things that we need to get right. And then we just want to use plain language, right? What are we trying to tell people what you can and cannot do in parks? Let's be as clear as possible. Some of that old language just really does not make a lot of sense. Um, and then finally, we do want to move some things into administrative rules, so we do have more flexibility. E-bikes right now are a great example. You're technically not allowed to have an e-bike in a park. That's just not reasonable, right? There's some mobility issues with that. We want to make sure we can move that into administrative rules so the flexibility for the director can change that as, to, as the technology changes. That's similar to how PBOT is currently doing administrative rules when it comes to things like e-scooters, one wheels, right? You've seen people on, on different devices. They move that into administrative rules so they can react more quickly when there are when there is new technology out there. So what we're looking for today, this is really just a precursor. So there's not a lot of answers for you today other than to say this project is here. Uh, we're doing the grounding, we're doing the discovery on it, and we're looking um, for representation and helping guiding this project. So looking for folks uh, from this group, knowing that we will be coming back on a regular cadence uh, so that we can up update you on what's happening. Um, and, and gather you know, some thoughts and experiences with safety and code issues in parks and helping us identify others who might need to be consulted in this work. Obviously, we're doing quite a bit of work internally on this as well, working with individual work units uh, on what they're seeing in the field and what their big issues are um, and with our rangers. But uh, again, we're in that grounding and discovery phase and we're, we're moving into a designing and a building phase. Um, so I'll kind of, I'll leave it there for any questions. And if there's any other kind of comments on this. So I just want to clarify, since you're asking for volunteers, it sounds like, are you, how many are you seeking? How many meetings are you planning? Yeah. Just so that people can be prepared for whether or not they are able to um, share that capacity. Yeah, absolutely. Um, anywhere from four to six folks uh, that are interested, you know, we don't want to necessarily limit it if there's additional uh, kind of input and representation. Uh, it'll be over the next four to six weeks, and we anticipate probably anywhere from um, 
probably less than an hour a week. Uh, really what we'll be doing is sharing some of what those individual codes are, what those um, potential changes may be, and asking uh, for folks in blind spots or any ideas on some of those issues. Thank you. I think Adam's tent went up first. Sure, okay. Um, I have a couple questions and yeah. I'll, I'll sort of ask them in easiest to answer yeah. order. Um, <laughs> so I'm looking at uh, yeah. the slide entitled proposed sections for updating. Mm -hmm. When you're asking for our feedback, are these the only sections that you're looking for feedback on or are there more? Not necessarily. Yeah, there may be more. Um, as we've opened this up internally, we've heard from others like, hey, here's something you know that we see that isn't quite right. So if there's other things that folks are seeing, we'd like to hear that. There's no guarantee that that might be picked up. These are kind of the initial ones that were the biggest and most important uh, from internally that we saw. But um, definitely open to hearing others. Okay. Um, and then you mentioned in one of the first slides, it was recounting the, um, oh, 98% resolved without police or fire intervention. Yeah. Can you just sort of like, give me an example of what resolved means? Is that like you got compliance? Did you throw somebody out of the park? Like, right, that would mean compliance. Yeah, so whatever tool we used was it was enough to say this person's moving on or this behavior had stopped uh, and we didn't have to then escalate it to the next level. There are some instances, although rare, where we do, you know, we, we may disengage, but police aren't able to necessarily intervene. But this is, that number does include when we requested assistance, but maybe didn't necessarily receive that assistance. So the issue may not have necessarily resolved, but we, we referred it to Portland Police to help us resolve it. Okay, so it's either resolved or escalated. Exactly, okay. yeah. Um, and then my last, I'll, okay, I'll make this my last question. Um, uh, I'm curious uh, if you could talk a little bit about, so in that escalation path, you talked about uh, ejections or exclusions. Mm -hmm. And so in the scope of the feedback that you're looking for the board, so two-parter, number one is, is, are you looking for input from the board specifically on those statutes that handle um, ejections or exclusions? And I was wondering if you could talk a little bit about the appeal process for exclusions. Mm -hmm. You know, you get a citation, traffic citation from the police, you have your opportunity to go to court and right. you know, represent yourself. Is there a mechanism for that in the Parks Department? Yeah, for ejections and exclusions currently, uh, that is handled through the code hearings officer. So again, it's a civil non-criminal. So you would submit that to the code hearing office. And then I believe it's within 30 days a hearing is set and it's determined was the rule followed by rangers to say, yes, this was everything was followed and it was valid. It's dismissed or not. Um, and I believe the first half of your question was whether or not we're interested in kind of opening up that question of the escalation. And I think at this point, probably not. I think it's more so looking at what is the, the meat of within the code. Okay, thanks. Yeah. Maybe just to clarify, the ejection is just for the day. Right. Right. Yeah. Right. yeah. 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 Or the exclusion is for the... For the 30, 60, 90. Mm -hmm. Thanks, Adam. Um, Alejandro. Yeah, I have a couple of questions, I guess, are more conceptual to this to this effort. The first one, it um, I guess it's whether within this exercise, are you guys looking to also um, revise or review kind of like the actual goals that the park rangers are are are, um, are doing just by just by quickly looking at the, the list of issues that you identified, mm -hmm. some overlapping with some potentially some other park staff and other <coughs> agencies. Um, and I guess in relation to that, it does seem like the revision of, of Title 20 is more related with sort of like the, yeah. the results or the, or the actual consequences of the, of mm -hmm. the, of the roles of the, of the Rangers themselves and not the really of the work that they do. Uh, in the field. So I don't know if you can talk a little bit about that. Yeah, I think to your first point, we're really interested in particularly internal learning. What are those biggest pain points that folks are having when it comes to code compliance in parks? And so trying to identify those top things. And that's kind of where this initial list came up uh, was saying, what are our biggest problems that we're seeing and how can we help our teams that are internally having those biggest problems in parks? Um, so I would say that's kind of our answer to, to 
to the first part and that's kind of why we're here today is to then get more of a community perspective and then think through okay now where else do we need to be reaching out to to kind of help identify what are the community what does the community feel are some of those top issues knowing that you know rangers as a civil you know non-criminal enforcement entity we're not going to be able to solve all of the problems but like Portland street response right like there is a subset of things that we should be able to resolve um, and do it in-house as much as we can Um, I think uh, Adrian and then Paul and then Ali, I think. Yeah, um, love the park rangers. I think we should have <laughs> similar programs for other parts of Portland, um, you know, community stewards. Um, uh, so I had a question about to what extent they're engaging with mental health issues, especially around, you know, harassment of other folks attending the park and that type of thing. When do you get Portland Street re response and is there a gap in all of that now? Yeah, um, I mean, I would say in the last six months with the advent of Portland Street response and the introduction of the street services coordination team if folks have heard of that that's that's a really um, kind of encompassing body where different bureaus come together to help problem solve that's been a big player in helping resolve some of those issues in terms of getting support out on the street quicker than we've ever had it in the past um, there definitely is still a gap between some of that acute care and the long-term care right we're solving for some of the immediate issues but that doesn't always resolve it for the long term. So you, you may have um, someone that's returning to the same park at the same location. Our training regimen is very focused on trauma-informed care and communication de-escalation. So we're able to engage with those populations effectively, but like all of Oregon, we may solve it for the day, but we're not necessarily solving it for the long term. Um, and that's something that you know is a gap system-wide but i would say we're, we're having a better experience now with the advent of psm and with street services coordination of getting folks at least some level of assistance for the day and providing at least a better visitor experience um, for those folks in that moment yeah. thank you paul before you ask your question i wanted to just pause for a moment and see if anybody showed up for public comment i don't see anybody in the room i just wanted to make sure I just wanted to add to Victor's comment. Uh, right now, at least, uh, the park rangers are doing the most referrals <laughs> to shelter than any other service that's being offered, whether it's through the county or other city services. And so it's really like, well, that's not why we created the park ranger right. program. Right. We're out in the community, interacting with the community, <laughs> folks that are needing shelter, they're getting the most referrals right now through the park ranger program. Yep. Yeah. So again, that's kind of that daily day to day, you know, we're able to get that, but, you know, long term, that's something for, you know, larger discussion. Thank you, Todd. Um, so if there's nobody here for public comment, we'll go to Paul and then Allie. Thank you. Um, a good presentation. I wanted to come back to reviewing the Rangers roles. So 30 FTE for 280 parks, which means, you know, seven days a week, 24 seven, you're spread really thin. So I'm curious, um, it's great that we're having community outreach to see what the community thinks the needs are. But I'm really curious, in addition to the things that you're taking on that nobody else is doing, what are the key things that you feel the Rangers should be doing that they're not able to do currently? Yeah, I think, Paul, the biggest thing is, to your point, there's more calls and problems than we're able to resolve. And so it really is a staffing issue. Um, so it was exciting to hear Commissioner Ryan speak about parks being part of the community safety spectrum. And we see that as well, is that these are spaces that people should be able to feel comfortable, our staff should be able to feel comfortable. So that'll be part of our work when we talk to uh, leadership and the council on this is, we can do really good things and you just heard right we're doing the most referrals we can do really good things um, but there has to be some sustainable growth to the program in order to get there so um i th i think in terms of roles we're we're hitting it uh but the bodies is, is the hardest thing and can i briefly add just really briefly add to that is you know in addition to what rangers are are not able to respond to our model is, you know, we have three tenants that we really focus on resource protection, community engagement, and park community safety. 
And when we're in response mode with, with, with the limited resources that we have, that re resource protection piece is a big component that we don't get to proactively do as much as we, we can. So I think that would be the biggest thing, Paul. Um, we certainly are as uh, very uh, efficient with the tools that we have, but we'd like to be ahead of some of the situations that we're seeing instead of being in response mode as much. So Todd, sorry to cut, cut you off. No, it's just gonna add a little more definition. The incremental steps we made the past year is to have supervisors on seven days a week for all of our shifts, where we used to have rangers in the field without supervisor support and without dispatcher support. Support. So we've added both four dispatchers to be able to cover, cover seven days a week and then also supervisor support. And then that 24 versus 30, the six new full-time rangers are being funded through the federal stimulus dollars. So council supported that as a one-time investment to increase uh, the funding for the rangers. A conversation both with our new parks commissioner and with the council coming up is to make sure we have the ongoing funding to keep those rangers on. And then the open question is how big does the city want to make the ranger program? As Victor said, there's a lot of needs out there. Thank you, Todd. Uh, Allie, Aaron, Corbin. Yeah, um, so uh, thinking about, right, the Ranger program is like active compliance, right? I'm wondering about the investment in passive rules, right? Like signage and how you're able to, you know, make sure that that is updated throughout. I know like Kelly Point Park, there's some real updated signage, right? There's a lot of places with some really outdated signage. So there's ways in which we can People don't always know, right? So how are, what's the investment in that passive in order to be able to then you escalate up to the more active and then you escalate up, right? Yeah, oh, absolutely. And this is something that came up um, it's like almost six months ago. We were talking with the director's office about now that we've got a more fully staffed comms team, how can we get some of that universal language out at all of our parks, replace a lot of our outdated signage and talk again as the community and what we hear internally, what are those top things that we're seeing? How do we display that in a way that's universal, but also welcoming, right? Here's the behaviors and, and types of uh, activities we want to welcome in our parks without you see a lot of prohibited signage, right? You can't do this, you can't do that. Well, let's talk about what we should be activating in our parks. So you're absolutely right. That's something that we're working on now as we talk with our internal comms team about how do we then um, you know, work internally, gather that information and then get it out there. Yeah. Um, I just, I don't know, this isn't like a fully formed idea, but I know that um, last night budget advisory committee safety is a key priority um, or a value of that group. And then I'm on mission vision values, safety keeps coming up. And I'm just uh, thinking about how having maybe, maybe already are like larger conversations around a holistic view around safety, what are the different kind of players within the bureau when we talk about that broader value of safety and then making sure that we're understanding that from a community perspective, what that means, and um, kind of leveraging different aspects of the Bureau and the board to um, aid in that value. So again, it's not really a question, just a comment, something kind of percolating in my mind as I am listening to this conversation in um, communication with other conversations I've heard recently. Yeah, yeah, I think you're, I think you're right on. And as the Bureau has matured with the levy over the last couple of years, we've been able to really grow our risk and safety program. And that's still kind of in its infancy, you know, it just in the last 24 months, but we're starting to see some of that, um, that more holistic approach and a more global perspective on um, looking at the risks and the problems within the Bureau. So I think we're going to see some really good returns in the next couple of years. If we're able to, you know, move forward with some of these Title 20 updates, look more uh, analytically at some of the data that we're getting about what are the claims that we're seeing with workers comp and general liability, you know, what's happening in our parks. We're going to be able to use that information to um, uh, create essentially a better program and, a, and safer parks. Yeah. Just, just to add to that, Victor, thank you for that. Um, in 2019, the, the initial updates to Title 20 was specifically centered around safety. So we enhanced our exclusion model uh, because of some of the situations that we're seeing, not only in our outdoor spaces, but in our community centers. So we enhanced our exclusion model to address some of those safety concerns that staff and patrons were facing. But the, the um, 
whole uh, remodification or reassessment of Title 20 now with the work that Cameron's doing and, and Victor is working with is is promoting safety at large with our with our city core values in mind of equity and transparency. If we're able to articulate to people and get the information out on what the, the standard is for um, our park and city code, uh, it will it will help our staff um, be able to you know de deal with some of the issues that they're seeing in terms of our land stewardship staff that helps make perform maintenance on the land uh, on the on the properties that we manage, uh, but also that you know our staff can also you know um, take action where needed uh, to to keep our patrons safe and, and our staff. So I think that essentially this th this entire work is about the promotion of safety in addition to what Victor said, what's happening with our safety program. Thank you, Mr. Thank. Are you passing? Yeah, I'm looking at the time. Okay. Chris. Uh, I just wanted to say I'd be really interested uh, in serving on the committee. And I also think it would be really interesting to see the regional breakdown of where the calls are. So you could try to see the split of like what's community safety calls, what is the amount of time spent on community engagement, and what is on resource allocation. Because I think it's a really unique model of, of education that the park rangers use instead of uh, like a more compliance authoritarian way. And a lot of times because there's all of these policies that are about this and that a lot of times it is just people don't know yeah. and if yeah. you are able to move away from a little bit less of the response things like you can do a lot of stuff with modeling behavior and community engagement activities um, and communities that people may be not calling all the time um, for park rangers yeah. but they could really benefit um, from that type of community engagement with a, a, a park ranger so yeah, no, absolutely. So if folks are interested, please email myself or Cameron. You'll see it on the bottom of that fact sheet that should be in your inbox. Um, let us know. Happy to set up some time and uh, maybe get you on a park ranger ride along if anyone if that helps pique the interest a little bit. regarding that process. Is that something that we'll do internally? Because uh, if we have too many people, on the board that say everybody wants to be on it right. say, yeah that would cause some issue right well i mean more than six we, in theory mm. right in theory our only constraint is if we have a quorum right. mm. i don't know what victor's plans are for his committee which is why i was kind of trying to tease that out a little bit if we have too many people volunteer we can do two meetings to make sure you don't have quorum <laughs> i'm definitely interested in the conversation um and if i can ask a follow-up question just really quickly what type of access do the rangers have to facilities when they're at parks? Um, in terms of- They have keys to the bathroom, everything. Yes, yeah, everything. everything. Mm -hmm. They carry a master key, yeah. And how, and I'm, I'll ask the other one offline just okay. in case there's like, you know, top mm -hmm. secret information. <laughs> but I'll ask offline. Yeah. On the ride along. <laughs> yeah. Oh, yeah, I want to definitely do that. <laughs> <laughs> well, I sticker and everything. Yeah. yeah, I kind of want to do a ride along too. And by the way, I think because of COVID, I think we haven't had um, new employee mentors in a long time. So maybe as those get launched again, we can get mm -hmm. board members, you know, cycle through that, that process. It, yeah. it's, it's worthwhile. Um, anything else for the good of the order before I? maybe let you guys thank you very much victor and thank vicente you. and todd for filling in extra extra gaps um anything for the good of the order before i adjourn two minutes early thanks everyone great meeting yeah thank you we are adjourned